Hey, uh, it's really great to be back here with everybody again. Uh, glad to see you guys are all coming out to hear like where we're going next in the book of Romans because it's really exciting. A couple quick things though. One, uh, last week I said something and somebody goes, what, where is that? What scripture is that? And I was like, I'm not sure. And the reason why is it wasn't scripture. So, uh, Conrad, what is the proper, what is the full scripture? It was 14, was it? Yeah. He, who, he whom God has justified, I said he will sanctify. The correct word is glorify. He who is justified, he will... Oh, you, oh, you corrected it on last week's tape. Yeah, I said you were quoting the commentary, and then I put the right version. Yeah, I was quoting. In fact, I couldn't find the commentary, but when I kept Googling it, because I tried to find it, where did I get that from? Uh, the Book of Common Prayer kept coming up. So maybe it's something out of the Book of Common Prayer, which is almost inspired, so that was close, right? <laughs> anyway, just saying. And then, um, darn it, um, remind me, Conrad, maybe this week, or one of you that reminds me of things, uh, I want to I want to send you guys a quote that uh, just today tonight I was I was kind of getting all set up I realized oh this would have made a great quote to um, to kick off tonight's study with and it was something about the veracity of Scripture because it's a whole article on how trustworthy the Bible is and I know a lot of you know this already but some of you might not know um, that when it comes to ancient documents there is no more infallible. Uh, proven ancient document than the Bible. And if that sounds like Christian propaganda, it's not. I mean, literally, if you compare it to things like Homer's Iliad uh, and the writings of um, the, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? The great philosopher starts with an A, Ar Aristotle, things like that. You have these gaps of almost a thousand years between the um, existent manuscript and what we have today, whereas the Bible uh, it's only a few decades, actually, at one point from the actual, um, from the writing and the witnesses to when we have the first manuscripts, and that's the New Testament, and then, of course, uh, I don't want to get too much into this, but the Old Testament, you know, from the Qumran um, scrolls that they found have proven that the Old Testament hasn't changed in 2,000 years, and likely not the 1,000 years before that. Um, it's incredible, and this quote was something really cool uh, that I want to send you. It says, it's, it's a very clear, concise sentence about why I believe the Bible, and I'm going to mess it up now, but it was something along the lines of, I believe the Bible to be historically accurate documents written by witnesses to events that were prophesied from thousands of years earlier. I messed up that part, thousands of years. But I thought that was really outstanding because that is really true. We, we believe this document that has been historically proven accurate, unchanged for a couple of thousand years, written by eyewitnesses to events that were fulfillments of prophecies that had been written anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years to 1,500 years earlier. And that is what we're going to look into tonight, because we're going to see that God's plan of redemption through faith, um, the concept of grace, isn't something that was invented by Paul in the first century, but it goes all the way back to Abraham. And uh, remember, uh, by the way, I wanted to apologize a little bit tonight too, because last week, even though we only did 11 verses, man, were they ever chock full of information. And I, I apologize because as a couple people pointed out, I sort of had the fire hose out, you know, <laughs> open wide, <laughs> you know. And some people were going, wow, dang, slow down or whatever, which has almost never happened in this Bible study. But, um, but tonight, it's, uh, it's going to be, we're going to cruise a little slower. Uh, we are going to do the entire fourth chapter of Romans, but we don't actually need to hurry through it because uh, the concepts are spread out a little bit more. But let's go ahead and jump into the review. Um, we talked about the depth and the width of sin. The depth is the 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 of man's depravity, the human heart, uh, where we would be without any kind of uh, binders on ourselves, and, and then the width of sin, and that is simply who's um, culpable of it, and of course we know it's everybody, every human being culpable of sin and being far less than the holy, holy, holiness of our Father in heaven. The great summary quote tonight will probably be the last night that I'll say it is this. 
after the flimsy edifice, the building, of humanly contrived righteousness has been leveled, will the apostle be ready to put in its place the sturdy foundation of the justification provided by God in Christ? So once any idea of my own righteousness has been leveled as if by a bulldozer, can Paul begin to build a foundation of our salvation by faith and faith alone? In fact, we began with um, pretty much the cornerstone of Christ. Now, um, uh, last week um, was sort of a new concept of a righteousness. Let me go back to my, uh, my actual scriptures here. A righteousness that is available apart from the law. We talked a lot about Jewish temple sacrifice. We, we entered these legal terms last week, which is why we took so long. Things like justification, grace, and redemption. And then this idea that God is both just, because he is just, but he is also the justifier. He makes us, um, he justifies us, and our role, of course, is only faith in him, right? In fact, he says it eight times in ten verses. Simple belief, and even that, as we saw from Ephesians, is the gift of God. So where is pride and boasting? Non-existent. We receive with great gratitude. And um, also, you know, it came up last week a little bit um, that was sort of new in my notes. This idea that just as all have sinned and fall short of the, of the glory of God, so is salvation, salvation available to all. Now, I don't know how that works. I can't exactly explain it. And we had some very long, <laughs> intricate conversations last week after the Bible study was over, which is why I didn't get out of here till about 10 o'clock. Um, because some of these things are unanswerable. But just um, if, if you go to verse 22, this righteousness from three, ver chapter 3, verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus to all who believe there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace. How that works, I don't know. But it seems like just as all have fallen short, somehow all have access to that, that faith and grace. Um, and again, don't stick around tonight to talk to me about it. In fact, um, I have to leave no later than 9.15 tonight. My son is flying to Canada at, this evening to do a, um, what do you call, mock UN? It's like mock trial, but it's mock United Nations, yeah? And I have to be home no later than 9.30 or my wife will kill me. So, and then someone else will have to teach next week and it'll get really complicated. So... Um, so, uh, so I don't know how that works exactly, but I believe that is what that is saying. Now, um, summary to this point. Uh, we began the book of Romans talking about worldview, like how every person on the planet has a worldview, how they see their life and how they create meaning in their life based on what they experience and what they know. But Romans is giving us what the Christian worldview, and I believe there is no other worldview like it. You hear people say things like, you just got to be good, and this goes completely against that. Nowhere on earth do we find a belief system where the all-powerful, sovereign creator God comes down to earth to be sacrificed on our behalf that we can be restored to him, and all we have to do is have simple faith in him, right? Right? And our response, I believe, we wrapped up this um, with this last week, should be fearlessness. If our God loves us like this, and if we have been justified by this faith, we should live fearlessly before our God. Amen? Okay, so this could lead perhaps to the question, is Paul mad? <laughs> like, where does he get this stuff? Like, is there any basis for such a radical claim as this, right? And last week, he alluded to the, what I call, historicity of this. Um, if you go to chapter 3, verse 21, look what he says. But now, but now, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So he's saying, this thing has now been made known. In other words, this is new information. It has been revealed, right? But what has been revealed has been testified to by the prophets 
and the law, going back to the Old Testament. So that was sort of like a teaser verse to set up his thesis statement that we are justified by faith. And now tonight what he's going to do is he's going to go back. And tonight we're going to go with Abraham, but next week will be Adam. And then he's actually going to get into, well, what now with the law? So the thesis statement from last week will now be unpacked over the next five weeks. Okay? So with that in mind, let's go ahead and... Oh, Garrett, go ahead. Quick, um, sure. Just to summarize that thesis, like you said last week, the old is the new concealed and the new is the old is the old. Yeah, so the, the new is in the old concealed, right? That's yeah. the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. Did I get it backwards? I don't know. I f no. Yeah, I think you had it, yeah? Yeah. And the Old Testament is in the New, te new Testament revealed. If that makes sense, yeah. It's a fantastic way to remember all of that. And, and by the way, um, it helps, when you read the Old Testament, you're like, what were these boneheads doing? <laughs> it helps give you grace. God did not reveal to them what he was doing. And they were living by faith under the law, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Only be revealed, right? Okay, anyway, so sometimes you look at guys in the Old Testament, you're like, I don't get why, you know, okay, they didn't know a lot. So let's, let's talk about the precedent of Abraham. Let's just read chapter 4, verse 1. We'll talk a little bit about Abraham, and then we'll, uh, we'll pick up the pace a bit. Paul says this, chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? Well, why Abraham? Well, by my notes, he cares about almost 2,000 years before Paul. And what Paul is showing is that this principle of salvation by faith is not new. And like any good teacher or any good preacher, Paul is going to use an illustration, a story, and an object lesson to put flesh on a theory. Like, what does it look like? What precedent do we have? And he's going to use Abraham. Now, one of the reasons why this is so radical that he's doing this is because at the time that he's writing to the Jews, remember this, Abraham's not just an Old Testament character to them. Abraham's the man, right? I mean, he is the man, the founder of their faith, you know? He is sort of the ultimate Jew, the ultimate example to every Jew. And Abraham also happens to be which is the beauty and the splendor of scripture and the genius of God, a great example of both faith and works operating well together. Because he had great faith in God and he did amazing things, right? What we're going to get now, though, from Paul's perspective and our perspective is sort of a different in how we look at it. Because a rabbi at that time would have taught about Abraham's great works, right? Paul is going to teach about his great faith, okay? Now, um, we, might, we might say this. I'm not sure how related this is, but perhaps all the animal sacrifices that they did, remember they were sacrificing animals, led them to believe that they were justified by their works of doing this sacrifice. But in the end, as we know, it was their faith in those sacrifices that saved them because we brought this up last week from Hebrews. It says, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. But they were operating, right, in faith. Okay, now a brief history of Abraham's story. Um, just Abraham's an interesting character. He kind of links what we call prehistory with verifiable history, right? Modern history as we know it. Because Abraham's kind of a link back to Noah, right? But he's sort of also linked to, say, Egypt, you know? Prehistory and known history. Abraham kind of sits right in the middle. By the way, Abraham, we don't think of Abraham as this way, as we kind of look at like an old guy with a beard, but he was a stud. Like, Abraham was kind of gnarly. He, like, took on all the kings of Sodom and stuff, stood up. Uh, stood up to uh, kings that were way more powerful than him. He gathers a whole crew of people, um, possessions, servants, multiple families. He sort of becomes a mobile kingdom unto, unto himself, yeah? 
other kings have to negotiate with him, but he's got one big problem, doesn't he? No offspring, no male heir. At a time when you were sort of judged by how many offspring you had, this was sort of a great act of shame. Yeah, in fact, his name was father of many, which would have just been a total nightmare. You know, as if your name was like Ripping Hot Surfer and you were a coop or something. I don't know. Greg, I was looking at you when I thought of that. Ripping, because yeah. Greg is a Ripping Hot no, Surfer. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, whatever. But I mean, so this was radical. And so from the get-go, when God says, I promise, I will make you into a great nation via your descendants. And he's old. This is huge. Okay, so let's pick up the story now uh, in chapter two, uh, chapter four, verses two and three. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, well, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, um, before I even go on um, to that, Notice it says in, in verse 1, Abraham discovered in this matter. Now, that's interesting. What, what did Abraham discover in the matter? Well, that's interesting. It seems like what he discovered was that he wasn't justified by his works. He wasn't seeking to be justified by his works. He had faith in God. Okay? So um, what I want us to do right now is I want to just read those six verses. So if you'll, we don't do this very much. We should probably do it more in this class. But hit reverse on your Bible and back up to Genesis chapter 15. And I want to read you, like, what was his great thing? So Genesis chapter 15, we're going to read... Um, the first six verses, by the way, this is right after a major victory uh, where he's not only had a major victory uh, over a bunch of kings, but he's also run into this really interesting character by the name of Melchizedek, who happens to be both a high priest and the king of Salem. Oh, that means the king of peace. Hmm, sound like anybody you know? Um, who happens to show up with bread and wine. Just saying. Oh, and Abraham tithes to this guy, which, by the way, you never tithe down. You always tithe up. Who's higher than Abraham? Hmm, just saying. Okay, but right after that happened, that, by the way, is a great story, Melchizedek, for some other time. But chapter 15, let's read verses 1 to 6. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. Whatever happened to that guy anyways? Hmm. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant of my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And verse 6, if you haven't underlined this already, you should right now. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. What has Abraham actually done at this point? Well, one thing he hasn't done, and we'll get there in just a second, right? So note how... Um, the, oh, I want to point this out to you. The book of Hebrews sort of ties... Abram's faith to his near sacrifice of Isaac. Now, what's up with that? I thought it was because he believed God that he would have many kids, but you see they're totally related. And the reason why they're related is this. God promises Abram that you will have children, and he believes him, and he's credited as righteousness. But for three days, that's how long it took him to walk to Mount Moriah, right? For three days, he's walking to Mount Moriah with, does that get the name right? Is it Moriah? Does that got that right? Yeah, thank you. Just doubting myself, yeah. <coughs> and it says, bless you. And it says in the book of Hebrews, he reasoned. I love that. I love that word. He reasoned that God can even raise the dead. 
And so what he believed was, even if I have to sacrifice my own son, Isaac, God will have to raise him from the dead because God promised that through my offspring, he will raise up a nation. Isn't that interesting, Yeah. So it's not like they contradict each other. If anything, that episode actually fleshes out, no pun intended, but sort of fulfills that idea of um, the promise. Now, by the way, um, this, you know, somebody pointed out a few years ago when I taught that this is not the first instance of grace in the Bible because a lot of people believe if you go back to the Garden of Eden, um, when, they re- when, they, um, were, uh, when it was revealed to Adam and Eve that they were naked in their shame, God sacrifices an animal to cover them in animal skins. And some people believe that that is sort of the first act of God's grace by covering them, which is, of course, a picture of the covering of righteousness that we now have in Christ. And it came at the cost of a blood sacrifice. So I'm just pointing, somebody had to point that out, and I I agree. So, um, okay. Anyways. What I love about that idea, so that comes back in Genesis chapter 15, and when um, Paul says that this is what Abram discovered in this matter, and to me, what I see is as if Paul discovered this verse. Like, like, Like that little verse, Abraham believed God and it was credited as righteousness, was like this little nugget, right, of truth buried way back from 2,000 years earlier in the Old Testament. And Paul looks back and he pulls out this verse and he brings it forward 2,000 years and goes, look at this. Look how God set this up from a long, long time ago. I love that, by the way. I just think that's phenomenal. So let's read verses 4 and 5. And you know what? I'm going to paperclip this one. Bible keeps tripping up. Okay. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now, this is simple math, the difference between works and faith. And I went back and looked at all the different Greek words. And it's simply this. Ergezomai, work, labor, or energy, is lagizemai, lagiz, sorry, lagizemai. By the way, I'm just making it up. I really don't even know how to pronounce these, right? But that is a banking term, which means credit, work, credit, not from ophilima, which, or not from charis, which is a gift, but a debt. So if you work, what you get in the bank is not from grace, right? but it's a debt that is owed, if that makes sense, right? But Paul is saying, if you have pistis, or faith, then the credit, the logizemi, right, is righteousness and justification. Do I need to say that again? Did I kind of mess that up, right? Um, By pistis, faith, the credit is righteousness, which, by the way, is the same word as justified. So when you look here in verse 4, and it says, to the man who does not, tr- uh, does not work but trusts, that's pistis, God who justifies, that same word justifies is the same Greek word where he says down below um, in verse 6, oh, excuse me, no, at the end of that same verse, his faith is credited as righteousness. So righteousness and justification being the same thing. Did all that make sense? If, you, if you, a man works, his bank account is because of a debt. But if you have faith, you get put in your bank account God's justi- justification and his righteousness. If I'm making too big a deal about that, the reason I do, and you're like, oh, okay, Dan, we get it, move on, I get it, right? <coughs> is because it's sheer logic. And this logic is absolutely what differentiates the the Christian faith from any other worldview on the planet. We are justified by faith. Abraham believed God, and the credit, just like it said back in the Hebrew, the credit is righteousness. He didn't earn it through his work. Now, we're going to like sort of unpack this, but first, I think it's kind of interesting. 
Paul's going to drag um, David into it. Yeah. So, so I'm going to repeat that for, um, for the camera. Lorraine says, Dane, I don't think you can teach it too much, and I'm inclined to agree. Um, because two things. I think for the believer, we need to hear it over and over and over again. And for the unbeliever, as you've heard me say before, you can teach this 10, 15, 20 times. And on the 25th time, someone's going to go, hang on a second. <laughs> the same person that sat under that teaching over and over and over again will say, you mean my justification is only from the faith and has nothing to do with the good works that I do? And you go, the answer is correct. And people are like, I got to think about it. Really? Yeah, really. And I've seen it happen. It's been a wonderful thing. I've seen that happen on a few occasions. People are like, you mean nothing I do, right? It is what you believe. Okay, so thank you, Lorraine. I, I just uh, actually had a long conversation with a young guy today in his mid-20s who's sort of going through that. Well, I don't think God likes me because, of, because I keep doing this sin, and then I repent, and then I do it again. And how much will God put up with? And what is the answer? <laughs> forever yeah <laughs> you know he would deal with it but you know what does uh, brennan manning say I, I took him to brennan manning brennan manning says uh there's this one time he went out onto a field somewhere and he looked up in the sky and he laughed out loud and he said i discovered that the father is fond of me and i said do you understand that god doesn't just love you but he likes you <laughs> doesn't that feel different you know of course god loves me like his god is love but does god like me yes that's why you like that song, yeah. Because the, the lyrics, we're going to come back to those lyrics in just a second, yeah. But let's, let's see how Paul, <laughs> he's gone all the way back to Abraham. Now he's going to drag David into it. Verses 6 to 8. David says the same thing. you got to love this, yeah. When he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Yeah? Now, by the way, if you're reading that and you're like, well, I'm not really exactly sure. What does that have to do with faith outside of works? You have to go back to read the rest of that psalm because that's from Psalm 32. And let me read you the other part of that psalm. This is the lead up to it. David says this, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night. Your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer, Selah. Then, and I love this, I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave, which means lifted away the guilt of my sin. Do you see what happened? Repentance, <laughs> confession, forgiveness. Forgiveness not based on works, but in repentance and confession. And confession is not a work. It is an acknowledgement of what is. Does that make sense? Yeah? So even that is the gift of God. So I love that Paul, by the way, we've covered Abraham. Now we got David. Next week, Adam. You know, he's calling out all the heavyweights, right, to show this. And now this is where... Um, I think we'll keep going to verse 16 and then we'll stop for questions and comments. Um, but now Paul gets into what I call the timeline to show, to show like the timeline's important. Let me just read uh, verses 9 through 12. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but not have been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Bingo! You got it? I think this goes without saying, but maybe some of you don't know this. When Paul says, when Paul refers to the circumcised, he's referring to Jews. Jews who had grown up and lived under the law. They were the circumcised. And, and by the way, um, 
circumcision was considered the great work. That was the great work of salvation according to the rabbis. Rabbis would teach that that was the work of salvation for men. But what Paul points out is Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness, but he had not yet been circumcised. So Paul is pointing out where does justification come? Is it from the faith or from the works? And obviously he's pointing out it's from the faith. Thus, what he's saying here is circumcision was the outward evidence of an internal change. Or better yet, he was cosmically changed and justified. Now, by the way, there's sort of a modern version of this for Christians. What is it? Baptism. Baptism. Glad you guys caught that, right? We don't teach that we are saved by baptism. What we teach is that baptism is the outward expression of what God has already done within us. The reason why we can have great faith in that statement is because the thief on the cross was never baptized. And yet Jesus says, I tell you this day, you will be with me in paradise, or also the, he, the Greek word, the garden. You'll be back with me today in the garden. So baptism is a work, but it springs out of the faith after the justification, after the faith, and after the salvation. But what's cool about this verse, if I could summarize, is note how it clears the way for everybody, both Jew and Gentile, yeah, to operate by faith, yeah? Now, this is interesting because I covered this very briefly uh, two days ago on Sunday morning. Paul brings it up way in much greater detail in the book of Galatians. But remember, the Judaizers were going, following Paul to where he had preached salvation by faith and going, no, 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 no. <laughs> Sorry about all that. Paul is a little confused. But now if you want to call yourself a believer, here's the things you have to do to earn your justification. And Paul goes, well, if you're familiar with how he writes he saves his harshest words in the New Testament for the church at Galatia, who says, you have walked away from your first love. You are preaching a gospel that is no good news at all. Who has bewitched you? Oh, you foolish Galatians, because they had gone back into a works righteousness, trying to earn the favor of God. And then, because we know that... Um, Faith precedes the circumcision. Paul sort of wraps up this little section with talking about how grace, the concept of grace, predate, predates even the law. It sets the precedent. So let's read verses 13 through 15, and then we'll take a quick breather. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing great on time. It was not through law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value and the promise is worthless because law brings wrath. And then this could get difficult, but we'll cover it. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Hold that thought. Okay, by the way, trivia question. How many years after Abraham was the law given? We have 450. Do we have another? <laughs> 425. 425. 425 is going once. 640. By my loose calculation, Conrad's going to prove me wrong later with an email, but that's okay. I'll confess next week. Text. Text. Yeah, text. Thank you. About 640 years later. Now, by the way, that's no small amount of time. Our country's only, what, 200 and some change, right? 640 years, a long time before the law comes. So the precedent is awesome. It predates the law. In other words, there was always grace, even before the official law, right? Yeah? It was always by grace. Um, so, well, I would say this, because this, well, let me, let me just read this quote. To introduce law keeping as a condition receiving the promise would have had two disastrous effects. It would put a question mark over the character of God for adding a condition, that would be the law, 
and it would make the realization of the promise impossible for men since no one has been able to fully keep the law. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, so grace has to predate the law because as remember, we covered last week and it's going to come up again, I think in chapter six, it comes up, maybe it's in five, I forget now. But the purpose of the law is to drive men back towards grace, ultimately. It also reveals um, the righteousness. Now, just so you know, there's this little awkward bit. Wait, where there is no law, there's no transgression. So if there's no law, there's no sin? No, <laughs> clearly not. Not exactly sure where Paul is going with that. But um, if you go back to Romans chapter 2, verse 12, he actually says... But, but, but all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. Okay? So, you know, do with as you may. I'm not sure what he meant by that. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. But clearly, whether you have the law or not, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and need the justification of the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. Okay? So, we've talked about a bunch of concepts with Abraham, with David, the fact that grace predates law by 640 years, and that the idea of justification through faith alone goes back 2,000 years before even Paul. Does anybody have any questions yeah. or comments? Yes, Briar. Um, if grace is one of the foundations of who God is, okay. Then wouldn't grace have always been there? Yes, absolutely. Grace is eternal. I would abs absolutely awesome. believe that. Yeah, good question. But yeah, grace predates the law even. Yeah, it was always there. Yeah, good question. Anybody else? Sorry, Orpheus. Curiosity. Uh, if circumcision was the great works for men, what was it for women? Don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Orpheus, you, you just like, let's play stump the pastor. No, but just so you know, as I was teaching on that earlier, I recognized that there is none. However, I would say this, um, this is kind of a, hard to explain this in a short, what, do you have one, Tom, before I go into this? I think it was the, the wife was under the headship of the husband. Of the husband. I was just, that was exactly where I was going. Thank you. Um, so the question is for the camera, um, if circumcision was the great work um, for the male Jew, what was, was or was there a great work for the female? And the answer is no. And the reason why, uh, I don't, without going into a long explanation, but what Tom answered is absolutely correct. And that was the salvation of the family in the Old Testament is patriarchal. I think that's a word. It sounded fancy. Patriarchal. Is that a word? I don't know. It came through the patriarch. Now, this is almost offensive to us 21st century evangelicals, particularly living in America, which is probably the most, um, in history, the country where the idea of the right of the sovereign individual to make choices in his life is sort of the supreme value. But just so you know, the Old Testament doesn't work that way. And that kind of drives people nuts because we want to say things like, we always like to look back and go, you know, well, was, was Hezekiah saved? <laughs> you know, he didn't say the prayer. He didn't do an altar call. How did he, you know, it didn't work that way back then. They didn't look at it like that. They looked at it as family units. And if the patriarch was a man of faith, then salvation came to the rest of the family through the patriarch, not only unto the wife, but to the children as well. And perhaps even, I might be stretching the analogy a bit here, I would even go to the whole household, the servants and everybody. Does that make sense? This is an uncomfortable topic for 21st century evangelicals because we're like, did he make a decision for Christ? <laughs> did he make a decision? Well, people didn't make decisions that way in the Old Testament. They were sort of believed in, they followed in, they were under the headship of... So that was actually a good answer, Tom, and that's where I was getting ready to go, Orpheus, and so I would, I would stand on that. Yes. That is an interesting point. So Don's point is, what would it have been like to hear Paul preach strictly to a Gentile audience? 
and not, uh, well, you know, I'm thinking of that one time, where was he in Athens? Uh, men of, is it men of Athens? Where you have a tomb to the unknown God, and I'm here to tell you who that unknown God is. So Paul, I think we do have an example of that now that I think about it. It's in the book of Acts, correct? Somebody, Conrad! Conrad's like, <laughs> looking at it. Thank you, work on it. Um, and he preaches to the, um, I almost said prophets, wrong word. He preaches to the philosophers, and I think it's Athens. It might be Ephesus. Mars Hill. Mars Hill. Thank you. In Athens, right? That's where Mars Hill is, right? Because I always get confused because doesn't he say men of Ephesus in a different occasion? But on Mars Hill, he, yeah, he preaches. So, that, so it's interesting. He doesn't appeal to the um, Old Testament. He appeals to their logic, which, by the way, is super cool. Yeah, like he actually goes toe to toe with the philosophers of Greece, yeah? And it's, it's pretty amazing, and then they throw them out. But anyways, I believe. Tom, in the back. It would have been sort of a presupposition, by the way, this is, I'm freestyling right now. <laughs> so take this with a grain of salt. Um, I think the, one of the presuppositions that all Greeks, Gentiles, would have had about Jews is monotheism. Um, you know, the Jews at that time, might be a little bit on thin ice on this because I think Zoroasterism, what, how do you pronounce that religion? Yeah. Was that monotheistic? And did that predate Jews? Anybody? Bueller? Nobody. Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> but Jews would have been very much set apart from virtually every other nation that worshipped small g gods and always a plurality of gods. They were all polytheists. The Jews actually in Rome at different times, you know, either suffered persecution or were given a pass um, for, uh, were allowed to be monotheistic. And that really would have sort of set them apart as a different culture. Paul comes along, he's, he continues in this vein of monotheistic uh, theology, uh, which would have, which, which I think the, the Gentiles would have recognized that. They, they would have sort of been ready for that, if that makes sense. Uh, I think we should keep moving. Uh, we got about 20 minutes. By the way, I've told Alan gets to share tonight for three minutes because he's been waiting five years. Ten. What? Ten. Three. Oh, you've been waiting 10 years. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I thought we were negotiating. Whatever. Okay. Um, Let's move on to verse 16. Therefore, boy, you got to like that. There's, that sounds like a big chunk of change happening there, right? Therefore, therefore, when you, whenever you come across a therefore, you say, what's it there for? In other words, in the light of everything we've just covered, the promise comes by faith so that it may, may be by grace. Bum, 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 bum. Guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Jew meet Gentile. Gentile meet Jew. <laughs> okay, um, Everyone by faith is considered the offspring of Abraham. In fact, let's read the first part of 17a. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. You catch that? Isn't that interesting? You almost wonder like a Jewish um, Pharisee or theologian going, yes, yeah, son of a gun. I never thought of that. You know, God's promise to Abraham wasn't, I will make you the father of a large nation called Israel, right? I will make you a father of many nations. And it, you know, it took 2,000 years before you know, it would go out to all the nations, but I love that it was there. And then the rest of that verse um, says, he is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead. And I love this and calls things that are not as though they were. And that's that great. That's why we sang that Jeremy song tonight, because the line in the song is, I am who you say I am. And he has called us righteous. 
no matter what you might think about your life in your deepest, darkest moments, he has called you that, right? I love that. He calls things that are not as though they are. And so that line in that song, I am who you say I am, not who the enemy says, not who my doubting sinful nature says I am, or my spouse. Just saying, you know, <laughs> Mike. The question is, um, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith. It sounds like, you know, one is saved by law and one by faith, but he's made this whole point that we're all saved by faith. So I I'm with you on that. It seems as though that uh, those who are of the law would be, because his whole point is Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile. But clearly we're all, uh, he is the father of us all. We are all saved by faith. Yeah, but it's a good question. It it's, it's one of those awkward ones that doesn't fit perfectly, but in the, you have to take the greater context of it, yeah? Um, anyways, um, by the way, it's kind of cool that he says um, he gives life to the dead because Abraham thought his body was dead, right? That, that it, w it was over. And then he believed that, yeah? In fact, from um, he Hebrews, um, well, I, I kind of mentioned this already, but I want to read you the verses Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead and figuratively speaking he did not he did, figuratively speaking he did receive Isaac back from the dead a couple of things that's from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 9 uh, excuse me verse 19 and not only does he sort of figuratively receive Isaac from uh, not killing him but when he thought his body was dead too old to produce children he produced Isaac, yeah, with, with Sarah, yeah. And then um, God, of course, proves it with his own son, Jesus Christ, and then he proves it again in our lives by resurrecting our lives up from the dead, which, of course, um, um, we exemplify through the outward act of baptism to signify what God has done. I brought this up on Sunday morning, so without going too detailed into it, but when we go under the water, and this, by the way, is in Romans 6. We'll be covering this when we get there. We go under the water. We share in the death of Christ. It's a picture of dying to ourself such that as we raise from the dead, it is a picture of us being raised unto the new life in Christ. Yeah, our resurrection. Now, um, for some reason, I wrote, um, he declares us who are not as though we were levels of this um, we, I, we get that we who are unrighteous get declared righteous. Um, but when you add God's great creative power, the idea that like he called the whole universe into existence, and then you add C.S. Lewis's idea of us becoming teleos, fulfilled, yeah? When you put it all together, it's kind of like this. We were shadows of what we were created to be. And now we are like, have become real if that makes sense yeah now we have the potential to be who god created us to be a neat analogy i, I like to use that is um if you take a milk carton and you scrunch it right sin takes what god creates and it corrupts and it twists right and there's something about when by faith we are declared righteous now, it's like we get expanded back to our full shape, that we will be, learn to become who he created us to be. And it is an ongoing process in our life that is called teleos, which remember is where we get the word telescope, which, you know, like a pirate's telescope, you we are expanding and being fulfilled in who we are to be. And if you still haven't read... Um, the Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, I highly recommend it because the imagery through that whole book is getting closer to God is to become more real, yeah? And remember what Paul says um, in Colossians, those things were shadows compared to the reality of Christ. And so our lives are mere shadows until we find our fulfillment in Christ, and then we become real. And then let me wrap up these last few verses. Verse 18 through 21. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. 
so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief. We'll come back to that regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Now, two things I love about this. I like it says this idea of being strengthened in faith because it implies a growing faith. In other words, that his faith in God wasn't perfect out of the gate. It was enough. But God would continue to grow his faith, which is the only way I can reconcile the next statement when he says he did not waver. Because I believe Hagar might have disagreed with that statement, right? <laughs> if you know the story, God promises him a son. And after some years go by, um, Sarah gets a little bit impatient and says, Why do you, this is never going to work. Why don't you sleep with your servant Hagar? And Abraham, great man of faith that he was, says, okay. <laughs> and this causes all kinds of trouble, which is still going on, which is we will be there in Israel in a few years, and we will see the fruit of that mistake. It's still there, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, come see me after the lecture, whatever. But Abraham was far from perfect, and I think we should all rejoice in that, because we are all far from perfect, right? And yet, that doesn't change God's declaration of us, of calling us, Briar, what we are not, as if we are, okay? But he was strengthened, which, by the way, that word strengthened, it means he received strength. In other words, it wasn't his strength. He was strengthened, implying a third party giving him strength, i.e. God, right? So that he was fully persuaded, which that Greek word means completely led. In other words, he was led into full persuasion. Hang on a second, Orpheus, yeah? And so to summarize this section, though his faith was weak, though our faith is weak, it is growing. But in the meantime, we continue to follow him because being fully persuaded means being led. We are fully persuaded even as we are being led behind him who leads us, who of course is Christ the shepherd. And that should help us, again, sort of have grace for ourselves, even though we have imperfect faith. Does that make sense? Okay, let's wrap up these last two uh, verses, or three verses, I should say, 22 to 25. And this is why it was credited to him as righteousness, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Wow. Yeah, that is. Somebody said hallelujah, and I agree, which is... Um, which is why um, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, by the way, there's an interesting little delineation right there that I don't want to go too far into. Um, but notice he says his death was for our sins and raised for our justification. There seems to be a delineation between the forgiveness and the death and the raising unto justification. I don't really know a whole lot what to say about that, only that's one of those little quirky things that interests me, you know? So I guess the debt is paid because there must be uh, sacrifice, there must be a giving of life, and we know from, what is it, Leviticus chapter 17, the life is in the blood, so the blood shed provides the forgiveness, but then as Christ is raised, we are raised in him into our justification, and therefore declared um, that which is not. We are declared righteous. Okay, uh, let me wrap up with this. Why is this so important? <laughs> uh, see how we are persuaded to avoid the trap of two extremes, which is one, I'm a sinner and I'm forced to live in this crushing guilt of uh, my failure. And the other extreme is, well, I'm basically a good person, <laughs> right? Neither one of those works in this situation here, yeah? 
The sweet spot right down the middle is being persuaded that through the, that the offering of Christ's sacrifice, his blood on my behalf, I am forgiven. And that per, being persuaded that God has the power to raise me from the dead just as he did Jesus Christ. So now I am justified. Which, by the way, is why we sang the song tonight, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Because what that verse says in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, I pray that their eyes would be opened. And then he says, and I'm going to paraphrase it, that they might see and understand that the same power that God used when he raised from Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that is now available to you for your salvation. Isn't that interesting? The same power that he uses to raise his son is the same power that is at work in you to justify you. And Paul says, I pray that your eyes would be opened, that you would see and you would understand that. The reason why that's so key is, is because the rest of Ephesians is about how to live out this faith. And you can't live out this faith unless you understand that you're already justified. And the world gets it exactly backwards, the cart before the horse. If I live a righteous life, then I receive salvation. And Paul says, no, you receive salvation. And open your eyes to see that now you have the power to live out a righteous life. And it won't be perfect, but it will be a constantly growing and evolving um, sanctification to become righteous. Right. Uh, yeah. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realm. So we, like Abraham, receive strengthening growth in faith while operating fully persuaded that he can fully bring us all the way there. Amen.